Committee will come to order. The Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee will now come to order. Today's hearing will examine the Community Reinvestment Act's rating system. Specifically, this hearing will investigate how accurately CRA ratings reflect bank practices. Now, without objection, the chair and the ranking member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, members and witnesses will have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials uh, for the record. Uh, as at the outset, I want to point out that uh, uh, Mr. Issa has been called to California uh, concerning the fires that are uh, devastating uh, so much of the of the south part of the state. And so uh, we, our, our thoughts and our prayers are with the people of California and uh, with Mr. Issa and his constituents as they endure this, uh, uh, this severe threat of fire. I um, want to thank Mr. Issa's staff for their cooperation. And certainly uh, any uh, member from the Republican side who shows up will be invited to fully participate. So I, I thank you. And uh, with uh, the consent of Mr. Ice and his office, uh, we're, we're going to start this hearing. I, um, I, I want to um, welcome the witnesses. I'm going to proceed with an opening statement, and then we'll uh, invite you to join in the discussion. This is the third in a series of hearings on subprime lending and the response of regulators. Our first hearing in March examined the subprime mortgage industry and the problem of foreclosure the payday lending industry, and the enforcement of the Community Reinvestment Act. In our second hearing, the subcommittee took a closer look at the foreclosure crisis in Cleveland and its relationship to the Federal Reserve Board. And in this hearing, upholding the spirit of the Community Reinvestment Act, do CRA ratings accurately reflect bank practices? We're exploring, exploring the coincidence of persistent discrimination in lending and a 98 percent passing rate among banks on their CRA exams. We hope that by the end of this hearing, we can identify a few solutions that will enhance the CRA and its enforcement by the regulators so it better reflects discriminatory practices by regulated banks. Congress enacted the Con Community Reinvestment Act in 1977 to combat redlining practices by the banks. As mayor of Cleveland at the time, I was one of the first mayors to sign a Community Reinvestment Act agreement to hold banks to account for their history of discrimination. CRA made illegal the banking practice of arbitrarily and systematically refusing service to low and moderate income and minority communities. The CRA applies to federally insured depository institutions and is enforced by regulatory review. Enforcement is delegated to four federal agencies, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Federal Reserve System, the Office of Thrift Supervision, and the Comptroller of the Currency. The regulatory banking agencies have a powerful enforcement tool the authority to deny or approve a banking institution's application for a new charter, a new branch, a merger, or an acquisition. Banking regulators exercise this authority based on an institution's CRA rating, which measures the bank's performance to meet the credit needs of its communities. Failure to meet the credit needs of its communities can translate via the CRA and its rating into a missed opportunity for the bank to acquire more wealth, making the CRA rating a critical incentive for banks to serve its minority and low and moderate income communities. But since 1990, the banking regulators gave failing grade in just 225 of 60,194 CRA exams. Uh, take a look at this slide. And the staff has put up a slide on the board. Uh, I don't know how your uh, vision is, but if you can see that, you're better than I am. But uh, today, 98.4 percent of all regulated banks pass the CRA. Compare this to 1990, when only 90.4 percent of regulated banks received a passing CRA rating. Does this significant rise of the number of banks that pass the CRA suggest that in 2007, banks are improving their lending practices? Does a passing grade accurately reflect bank lending practices? Well, not necessarily. Let's look at slide two. According to a recent study conducted by the National Coalition for Community Reinvestment, 24 of the 25 largest U.S. metropolitan municipalities and their surrounding areas 
have fewer banking branches in densely populated urban centers than the less populated suburbs. Today, nearly 14 million households, or 21 percent of all U.S. households, are unbanked, meaning they have no relationship to a bank or credit union. Other households are underbanked in that they have deposit accounts but often seek services from payday lenders and check cashers. Not only do minority communities have less access to banks, but according to the uh, 2004 HMDA data, uh, when they do have access, African American and Latino populations receive a disproportionate share of higher rate home loans. Slide three, even after accounting for differences in risk, borrowers of color were more than 30 percent more likely to receive a higher rate loan than uh, uh, than white uh, borrowers. So our question is this. How can banks be passing the CRA at such high rates while the HMDA data show statistically significant racial discriminatory lending practices and while bank services for low and moderate income communities are diminishing? We invited federal banking regulators here today to help us answer that question. In exploring this conundrum, this subcommittee identified several regulatory and statutory issues that raised red flags. These include the discretionary latitude exercised by banking regulators, the lack of transparency of the CRA exam process, and the incongruency of the 1999 Graham-Leach-Bliley Act and the CRA. The regulations surrounding the review of banks are broad and undefined, although the regulations stipulate that evidence of discrimination adversely impacts a bank's CRA rating. The regulators do not stipulate a mandatory downgrade in the face of such evidence. As we dug deeper into the matter, we found cases where the Department of Justice prosecuted a bank for Fair Housing and Equal Credit Opportunity Act violations, while simultaneously the federal regulator issued a bank a passing CRA rating. Case in point. In 2006, the Department of Justice filed suit against Old Kent Bank for violating the FHA and the ECOA. In its complaint, the Department of Justice alleged that in spite of regulation, Old Kent Bank circumscribed its lending area in the Detroit Metropolitan Statistical Area to exclude, to exclude most of the majority African American neighborhoods by excluding the city of Detroit. Between 1997 and 2001, the Federal Reserve Bank not only gave Old Kent passing CRA rating, but it also approved Old Kent's significant branching activity. In January 1996, Old Kent had 18 branches in the Detroit MSA. Not a single one was in the city of Detroit. By March 2000, it had expanded the 53 branches located in every county of the Detroit uh, MSA, except for the city of Detroit, which at that point was 81 percent African American. Now, how can the Fed see this map, refer the case to the Department of Justice for prosecution, and give Old Kent Bank a passing CRA rating? We asked the Fed that question. We were told that in the Fed's discretion, the bank's practices were reasonable and legal. If discretionary latitude is broad enough to deem this donut hole reasonable, then perhaps it's too broad. But regulatory discretion does not explain everything. Something in the regulations makes it possible for the CRA rating to not reflect discriminatory practices. Now, in 1999, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a finding against Flagstar Bank for discrimination against minority borrowers. In 2001, a federal court in Indianapolis found a written pricing policy developed by Flagstar so overtly discriminatory that it ruled against Flagstar on summary judgment. During the period of Flagstar's violations, the federal regulator, the Office of Thrift Supervision, conducted five CRA examinations. It awarded Flagstar four satisfactory ratings, one outstanding rating. Significantly, the outstanding rating was awarded after a summary judgment finding in 2003. Now, how can Flagstar be awarded with passing CRA grades while it's being prosecuted for its discriminatory practices? 
we learned that one bank one way a bank can mitigate a low c r a rating is by agreeing to take corrective action to address its discriminatory practices discriminatory practices are found during a fair lending exam the finding of which are not made public unlike a c r a exam not only is the fair lending exam secret but so too are the negotiations on corrective actions between the regulatory agency and the bank this i think flies in the face of the c r a spirit which was born out of public protest and sustained by public participation. According to the Treasury Department, CRA-related home lending in low to moderate income communities increased in metropolitan areas in which lending institutions and community groups negotiated CRA agreements. An informed public and a participating public is the hallmark of the CRA. By negotiating corrective actions behind closed doors, Banks and the regulators create generic solutions that may not be appropriate for all. In exchange for generic solutions and the exclusion of public participation, banks like Flagstar maintain their good reputations and are afforded the privileges associated with, pass with passing CRA grades. Then there's another problem. It has nothing to do with the regulations at all, but instead is a problem with the law. In March 2000, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act effectively allowed financial institutions to merge with insurance companies, security underwriting firms, and mortgage lending companies for the first time in history. But the CRA was not amended to reflect this financial development. As a result, while a loan offered by a bank or thrift is subject to CRA review, that same loan evades CRA scrutiny if it's offered by that bank or thrift's affiliated mortgage company, finance company, or non-depository affiliate. This loophole enables banks to move their financial assets to non-covered affiliates to reduce their CRA obligations. Subprime borrowers are especially vulnerable to these unregulated lenders. According to Realty Track Incorporated, which compiles statistics on home ownership, last month foreclosures totaled 225,538, double the number a year ago. Would the numbers be different if these companies were the subject to, of CRA obligations? Has this legal, legal loophole enabled a surging foreclosure crisis? And if this is indeed the case, has Congress allowed the CRA to become obsolete in certain respects? We hope that with the insight of federal banking regulators, as well as community groups and advocates, we can answer some of these questions and find a way to restore this Community Reinvestment Act and uphold its spirit. Uh, with that, uh, my opening statement is concluded. And any member who shows up will be given an opportunity to participate in the uh, questions. Uh, I, um, uh, the subcommittee is now going to receive testimony from the witnesses before us. I want to start by introducing our first panel. Ms. Sandra Thompson is director of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation Division of Supervision and Consumer Protection where she directs risk management and consumer protection examination activities relating to approximately 52,000, uh, strike that, uh, 5,200 FDIC supervised institutions. Ms. Thompson previously served as the FDIC's deputy to the vice chairman and led the corporation's Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering supervisory activities. Prior to joining the FDIC in 1970, Ms. Thompson was an associate at Goldman Sachs and Company in New York City. She holds a degree in finance from Howard University. Welcome. Appreciate your presence here. Oh, thank uh, next, you, Chair. Uh, sorry. Uh, next, uh, uh, I, w I would like to introduce Ms. Sandra Brownstein, uh, who uh, I had the privilege of having uh, come to Cleveland to participate, and I appreciated your presence there as well as here. Ms. Brownstein is Director of the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs for the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. She currently oversees the implementation of the Federal Reserve System policies and programs regarding community and economic development. Ms. Brownstein also serves as the board's liaison to the Consumer Advisory Council and provides leadership to various consumer education and research activities. Before joining the Federal Reserve Board in 1987, Ms. Brownstein held positions in economic and community development for nonprofit government and private sector organizations. She's a graduate of American University. Thank you again for being here. Uh, Ms. Montrese Yakimov, is that correct? Yes. Yakimov is the Managing Director for Compliance and Consumer Protection at the Office of Thrift Supervision. 
Ms. Yakimov coordinates the agency-wide compliance and consumer protection programs at the Office of Thrift Supervision, including overseeing the agency's Community Reinvestment Act program. Prior to becoming uh, the uh, FRB in 2005, Ms. Yakimov served as Senior Vice President and Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Conference of State Bank Supervisors. She's, she has advised the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council Supervision Task Force on a broad range of state banking issues and has extensive knowledge of federal and state consumer protection statutes and regulations. Appreciate you being here. Uh, finally, um, Ms. Ann uh, Jedicke is the Deputy Comptroller for Compliance Policy for the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Ms. Jedicke is responsible for policy and examination procedures relating to consumer issues and anti-money laundering. She chairs the uh, FFIEC's Consumer Compliance Task Force and sits on its Bank Secrecy Act Task Force. Earlier in her career, uh, Ms. Jedicke served as the director for the OCC's Large Bank Division and also managed its uh, Problem Bank Division. 2001 to 2002, she led projects to restructure OCC's six districts and OCC's Washington, D.C. headquarters. Thank you for appearing. I want to, again, thank all the witnesses. Uh, before we begin, it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you would rise and raise your right hand. Do solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative, and you may be seated. I ask that each of the witnesses now give a brief summary of their testimony and keep, in this, keep the summary under five minutes in duration. I'd like you to bear in mind that your written statement would be included in the hearing record. So, Ms. Thompson, let's begin with you. Thank you. Chairman Kucinich and me members of the subcommittee, I'm the Director of Supervision and Consumer Protection for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. In this role, I oversee the agency's bank supervision activities, including both safety and soundness and compliance with consumer protection and fair lending laws. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the FDIC regarding the enforcement of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Fair Housing Act and how the FDIC considers compliance with the fair lending laws in assigning CRA ratings to financial institutions. As you stated, the purpose of CRA is to encourage banks to serve the credit needs of their entire communities. At the time CRA was enacted, there was a severe shortage of credit available to low and moderate income neighborhoods and concern about racial redlining and discrimination. While CRA and the federal fair lending laws have had significant positive impact, there still remains much work to be done. This afternoon, I'd like to focus my statement on a few key points. First, the FDIC is committed to protecting consumers and ensuring that the institutions under our supervision adhere to the letter and spirit of the fair lending laws. When the FDIC finds practices that violate these laws, we take action to ensure that the practices cease and that harm to consumers is remedied using a range of supervisory and enforcement tools. Where the violation appears to involve a pattern or practice of discrimination, the FDIC refers the case to the Department of Justice. Second, from January 1, 2002 through September 30th of this year, the FDIC cited banks for substantive fair lending violations in 237 examinations. Although most fair lending violations cited had already been corrected by the bank or were promptly corrected at the direction of examiners, more serious violations were addressed through informal and formal enforcement actions. In all cases, banks were required by the FDIC to remedy the harm experienced by affected consumers and to advise the consumers of their right to pursue legal action, and they were ordered to stop engaging in discrimination. During the same five-year period, 
the FDIC has referred 181 findings of illegal discrimination to the Department of Justice. Third, in addition to performing fair lending reviews as part of every compliance exam, FDIC examiners separately evaluate the CRA performance of the approximately 5,200 institutions we supervise. Fair lending violations are one of the factors considered in determining CRA ratings. Since 2002, fair lending violations have resulted in several CRA rating downgrades. In conclusion, CRA was adopted to address redlining and over its 30-year history has made a significant contribution to the revitalization of many low and moderate income communities in both urban and rural areas. Fair lending examinations are critical to achieving complete and accurate CRA reviews. The FDIC is committed to using CRA and fair lending laws in the continuing effort to address the credit needs of low and moderate income areas and individuals. That concludes my statement, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions the subcommittee might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Bronstein. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Chairman Kucinich and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the implementation of the Community Reinvestment Act and the enforcement of fair lending laws by the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve has a long-standing commitment to ensuring that every bank it supervises complies fully with federal financial consumer protection laws, including fair lending laws, and that every bank meets its obligations under the CRA. Consumer compliance supervision, which includes the administration of CRA and fair lending laws, has been a separate function at the board and the Federal Reserve Bank for more than 30 years. The Federal Reserve Banks are instrumental in carrying out the board's mission of consumer protection through their supervision of the approximately 900 state member banks for which the system has regulatory responsibility. Federal Reserve consumer compliance examiners focus exclusively on consumer compliance supervision and are required to complete a comprehensive training program that includes specialized intensive coursework on CRA and fair lending. A specialized fair lending enforcement section at the board works closely with Reserve Bank staff to provide guidance on fair lending matters and to ensure that the fair lending laws are enforced consistently and rigorously throughout the system. When conducting fair lending examinations, consumer compliance examiners perform two distinct functions. First, examiners make sure that management is committed to fair lending and has the appropriate systems, policies, and staff in place to prevent violations. Second, examiners determine if the bank has, in fact, violated the fair lending laws. Because the Federal Reserve requires the banks we supervise to devote significant resources to fair lending, and because we examine them routinely for fair lending compliance, we expect fair lending violations to be rare among the banks we supervise. Such violations are indeed rare, but when they do occur, we do not hesitate to take strong action, including referrals to the Department of Justice. Our record of referrals to justice demonstrates our firm commitment to enforcing the fair lending laws. In 2007, thus far, we have referred six institutions. These referrals included matters of ethnic and racial discrimination in mortgage pricing, racial discrimination in the pricing of automobile loans, restrictions on lending on Native American lands, and restrictions on row house lending that discriminated on the basis of race. Discrimination and other illegal credit practices will adversely affect a bank CRA evaluation. In our evaluation of a bank CRA performance, we take into account evidence that a bank engaged in illegal lending discrimination or other illegal credit practices. At the conclusion of CRA examinations, the examiners prepare a separate CRA public performance evaluation that describes a bank's record of helping to meet the lending, service, and investment needs of their communities. 
Examiners assign a CRA rating that reflects the institution's overall CRA performance. If examiners find fair lending violations or find other illegal credit practices, examiners seriously consider such findings when they determine the appropriate CRA rating. Examiners consider the nature and extent of discriminatory practices, the policies and procedures in place to prevent such practices, and corrective action taken by the bank. Examiners may downgrade the rating otherwise earned to needs to improve or substantial noncompliance. However, examiners assess the totality of the bank's record in the community in making this determination. Whether or not the examiner lowers the rating, they report their findings of discrimination in the public performance evaluation. The Federal Reserve is committed to safeguarding consumer rights in financial services. Key to this commitment is ensuring that every bank the Federal Reserve supervises meets the credit needs of its community and complies fully with fair lending laws. Our supervisory process evaluates each bank's compliance with the fair lending laws and takes that record into account when evaluating its CRA performance. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Brownstein. Ms. Yakimov. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Kucinich and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to present information regarding the activities of the Office of Thrift Supervision on issues related to the Community Reinvestment Act and fair lending enforcement. In my testimony today, I'll describe how OTS examines for CRA compliance compliance with fair lending laws, and how violations of fair lending laws and other illegal credit practices affect the CRA ratings we assign to savings associations. The Community Reinvestment Act calls for insured depository institutions covered by the Act to help meet the credit needs of the communities in which they operate. The Office of Thrift Supervision's implementing regulation requires the agency to assess the savings association's record of helping to meet the credit needs of its entire community, including low and moderate income neighborhoods, consistent with safe and sound operations. Additionally, the CRA requires OTS to consider each institution's record when evaluating an application for new branches or relocation of an, of an existing branch, mergers, consolidations, and other corporate activities. The regulations and examination procedures require examiners to consider such factors as the volume of mortgage and small business lending within the savings association's designated assessment area, the volume and dollar of lending to low and moderate income people, small business lending, small farm lending, and mortgage lending in low and moderate income geographies. Additionally, in some instances, performance is based on the savings association's community development lending and investments along with the ability to provide retail services to low and moderate income individuals. OTS assigns savings associations one of four ratings to meet the credit needs of the communities they serve. Outstanding, satisfactory, needs to improve, or substantial noncompliance. So through the CRA examination function, OTS reviews thrift institutions' record of meeting the financial needs of the communities they serve, including their record of lending to low and moderate income individuals. Separately, Fair lending reviews are an integral part of the OTS supervision to determine compliance with consumer protection laws and regulations. OTS, examines, pardon me, OTS examiners conduct a fair lending assessment during each comprehensive exam every 12 to 18 months. In addition to Humder data, examiners also use other information in their investigations, including consumer complaints, risks associated with the savings association's business channels, and the adequacy of the institution's compliance with management system. Through fair lending exams, OTS examiners seek to detect all forms of discrimination, such as redlining, as well as discrimination relating to pricing, marketing, and underwriting. If unlawful discrimination is found, OTS will make a referral to the Department of Justice or the Department of Housing and Urban Development in accordance with federal fair lending laws. Depending on the outcome of the referral and the nature of the violation, OTS may also take other actions to fully resolve the matter. For example, when applicable, the OTS directs the institution to cease violative activity, provide remedies to harmed parties, and improve its fair lending compliance controls and policies. 
Additionally, and notably for today's hearing, the Office of Thrift Supervision CRA regulations indicate that a finding of discrimination or other illegal credit practice will adversely affect the Savings Association CRA performance. Such evidence includes, for example, certain violations of the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Fair Housing Act, the Real Estate Permanent Procedures Act, Section 5 of the FTC Act, and the Homeowners Equity Protection Act. The extent to which the finding of discrimination or other illegal practice affects the CRA rating is determined by factors such as the nature and extent of the evidence, the policies and procedures that the Savings Association has in place to prevent discrimination or other legal credit practices, and corrective action that the Savings Association has undertaken or has committed to take, including voluntary action. Since 1990, in 37 instances, OTS has reduced the CRA rating of an institution in response to evidence of discriminatory or other illegal credit practices. In five cases, the downgrade was from outstanding to satisfactory. In 29 cases, the rating declined from satisfactory to needs to improve. And in three cases, the rating declined from needs to improve to substantial noncompliance. Both CRA and fair lending are critical parts of our compliance examination function at OTS. While we believe the regulation examination procedures equip us to make, to monitor both of these critical areas, we note that refinements to our processes are certainly something that we consider on an ongoing basis. We've taken such steps as building new econometric models, added, adding additional training, and additional resources here in Washington to support our subject matter experts in the field. Ensuring that CRA ratings accurately reflect not only how effectively thrifts serve the communities they serve, but that they're doing so in compliance with fair lending laws and in the spirit of the Community Investment Act are keen priorities at OTS. Thank you for raising this important issue, and I look forward to asking, answering your questions. Uh, Ms. Yakimov, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I've been informed that there is a vote on and so what uh, we're going to do is this. I'm going to recess the committee for 20 minutes, and that would bring us to about uh, five minutes before the hour. We will begin um, with Mrs. Jedeke's testimony, and then we'll go to questions of the witnesses. So I would ask that you uh, return in 20 minutes, and we'll start again. Thank you so much, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Committee's in recess.